Well, we know prayer works. So it's, some, some, it's something that when you know it, it's hard to keep it within you. So you want to share that, share the good with everybody, everybody you know, you know. So I was, uh, my little, I'm just going to talk for a second. Um, for Christmas, my dear friend and colleague, Reverend Arpad, gave me this great, he gave me this great book that sits by my bed, and it's called The Little Pocket Book of Mindfulness. So when we're thinking about uh, spiritual practices, I went through some of them that we, we do every day. Uh, you know, walking is a spiritual, spiritual practice. Almost everything you do is a spiritual practice if you do it mindfully. But there's a little thing in here about silence, and I just wanted to read this to you, just thought maybe it might, you know, ring some bells, because we're certainly not silent very often, are we? So the power of silence has always been recognized, but it has never been needed more than it is today. Our world is noisier than ever. We have headphones permanently attached to our ears. We interact with the world through emails, phone calls, and the internet. And although the, these technologies have their benefits, they can also serve as distractions and give us ways to just avoid being with ourselves. You know, many times I'll think, okay, I'm gonna sit down and just sit in the silence and oh, I'll forget to turn the phone off and the phone will ring or somebody will come to the door or, you know, something will happen and that silence is broken. So we do, we get distracted all the time. Staying silent and setting aside the distractions of reading and interacting with others can be liberating, truly liberating. We are freed from the need to make conversation or to assume a particular personality. We can just be be ourselves. And the silence allows us to notice more accurately both what is happening internally within each one of us and in the world around us. Our senses are heightened and our experience is sharper, richer, and more intense in our daily lives. I remember when I first started meditating, or sitting in the silence, uh, it was years ago when we were having a, a venture in faith with, in the center. This was like 20 years ago, 20, 30, 25 years ago. And we used to do a prayer before our banquet, 24 hours, and we had someone praying every half hour for 24 hours. And then the next person would call that other person all night long and say, you know, get ready for the, do you remember those RPAD? Get ready for the prayer, it's your, your next half hour. And, and uh, so I was, it, mine was 3.30 in the morning. I don't know why, but it was my slot, my time slot. And so I went into, I thought, okay, you know, I'll just, you know, pray for a half an hour or sit here and be quiet, be in the silence, and it was three hours later. And when I went, whoa, and I wasn't asleep, it was like I was in this deep state, and it was, Heavenly, it was heavenly, and um, I know Deepak calls it um, the gap. It's that space where you're just there, you're it. You're just a being being, not a being doing, a human being. Anyway, so if, uh, that's a very good spiritual practice, uh, is practicing the silence, and uh, on Sunday, uh, Dr. Heather did the uh, meditation, and it was wonderful. She set it up, and we had a chant, and then we went into the silence, but there was no background music, no nothing. It was just silent. And I'll tell you, it really went quite deep. It was uh, really d delicious is the word. It was delicious. Okay, so, and now, I'm happy to introduce 
someone who you don't who doesn't need an inter introduction. Reverend R. Pat Pat Petrus is a staff minister here at our center, and um, known him for years and years. And uh, his topic tonight is: Does your life purpose change as you get older? A warm welcome, please, for Reverend R. Pat. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Reverend Judy. I, I love that Rumi video. That was just yeah. fantastic. It was, I don't know, it was one of the better ones I've seen. Yeah. I wanted to pay attention. So that's my topic today. Does your life purpose change as you get older? And, you know, I was trying to figure out what the best way is to present this topic, you know. And I said, well, I don't want to be the only one talking here. I think it needs a conversation. I think it needs a conversation because I'm probably going to say, yes, your life purpose changes and you'll hear why, but maybe there's somebody in this room that doesn't think that. Maybe somebody in this room has a totally different perspective on their life purpose and maybe they've gone through something totally different. Okay. And I think this talk should really be about why are we here? Why are we here? And man has been asking that question for 6,000 years. Ever since man had the ability to reason, when they moved from being fight and flight to farmers, when they didn't have to worry about shelter and they could uh, spend a little time in the comfort of their home, they've been asking these questions. They look at the early Greeks, like Sophocles, and then Homer, and Euripides and all those guys are asking these questions. And, and as you go through history, Thomas Aquinas, St. Francis, uh, Nietzsche. What's his name? Sigmund Freud. He's actually listed as a philosopher, if you Google him. Um, Albert Einstein, Maya Angelou. They're all asking this question, why are we here? What is the purpose? Is there a God? Is there something beyond myself? When I die, what happens? What's on the other side? Am I just a lump of clay when I die? Or is there more? Everybody wants to know that. Don't you want to know that? Aren't you still trying to figure out what happens? I, I sometimes do, because I'm not, it's not absolute yet. I'm still writing the book. I still have many chapters left in me to write about. So what, so how is it possible that everyone can be right at the same time and wrong at the same time? How's that possible? If I ask an atheist what's the purpose of life, they're going to have one particular meaning. If I ask you guys in this room, which you are probably spiritualists, right? You believe in a higher power and a higher conscious. You're probably going to have a different perspective of why we are here. You know, we, we study religious science, but you know, Ernest Holmes didn't talk about a lot of stuff other than thought and thinking. He didn't talk about angels. He didn't talk about chakras and auras and crystals and talking to the dead and psychics. Where is all that in the world? Is it real or is it made up? I think you're, you're going to have a different answer if you ask that question. Because in my world, in my life, in my experience, all of that is real. It's not woo to me. It might be woo woo to somebody else, but it's not to me. I can remember way back in the day, I went to Long Beach for some kind of workshop on Carilion photography. Now, Carilion photography was a way to photograph your aura. Okay? They, you, they give you a picture. It was like real, tangible. And hey, there I am, there's my aura. But they also did kind of a very cool thing. They, uh, they did a meditation, like we all do, 
And uh, they took you on a journey, and, and afterwards everybody shared, just like we do around here. And everyone is sharing about what they saw and the people, and the colors, and the trees, and the animals, and the experience. And I got nothing. <laughs> I got absolutely nothing. I was so disappointed because how could I be so wrong? How could they be so right? What is this about? It was kind of disappointing. But, you know, I remain curious. And as I became more aware, I became more open. And as I became more open, more things began to come to me. I can remember another time where my wife and I, we went to see a famous psychic. Oh, has anybody been to a psychic before? What, what, what was your reaction to going? Was it real? Was, it, was they a joke? Are they, anybody have any comments? It was real. It was real. So what's interesting about that is that there was a question and answer section. And uh, my wife got to ask a question. And this lady gave the answer that there was no way in hell she would know that answer. Only my wife and I knew. And it blew me out of the water. How is that possible? How does someone talk to the dead? How does someone talk to another source, another energy, another life form? How is that possible? Why are we here? Why are you here? And then I remember another time. <laughs> now this is, this is actually funny to me. When you drive the five freeway in, in San Juan Capistrano and you happen to have Verizon, there is a momentary lapse in your cell coverage. Just for a brief second, it goes away, okay? So I'm driving down the freeway, and I'm having this argument with God, and I'm really pissed. I'm really angry, because I want a sign. I want something powerful. I want something obvious. I want an answer, and God was not cooperating. <laughs> I got nothing again, but then I did. Then it happened. And what happened was, for me, this energy just started floating around the top of my head. Went down the side of my face like it's doing now. Went down my shoulder, down my arms. And I realized for the first time, that is how I know spiritual truth. I don't necessarily see things. I don't necessarily hear things. But man, do I feel things. I am such an empath. And once I got that, my sign, my way of knowing spiritual truth, my barometer for wisdom, everything changed. Everything changed because spirit will always give you something that you can recognize. It's not going to give you something that might work for Gene but doesn't work for Reverend Judy. It won't be that way because you have to recognize and you have to trust. Okay? Now think about it. As a spiritual being, why... <laughs> Why would you believe in God in the first place? I mean, it's pretty airy-fairy, isn't it? I mean, you, it's not seen. You can't touch it. It's caused a lot of wars. Why would you believe it? But as a spiritual being, the only way it makes sense is if you can trust and verify. If you can prove that God's spirit is repeatable over and over again, that it's a demonstration over and over again, then you're going to trust. And you're going to trust that higher power. You're going to trust that higher consciousness because you know it's right for you. It's true for you. 
It's your truth. Not your truth, not your truth, not, it's your truth. And that's how you navigate the world. That's how somebody can be right all of the time and be wrong all the time, because it's your truth. And it's through you that things are possible, right? Spiritual truth. So once I... Once I got the fact that I can feel it, then I started to get the more answers. Again, more awareness. As you get older, you get what? Hopefully, you get wiser, except for some presidents I know. Um, you get older and you get wiser because you are more open to wisdom, you're more open to awareness. You're more open to your truth, and as you are more open, you get more information. So I found out that my life purpose was to preach, to teach, to speak, to motivate, and to create. That's what I, that's what it came up with through all my meditations and all my journeys and blah, blah, blah. That's what came up, and I go, yeah, of course, that makes totally sense for me. So what was I in the beginning? I was a university professor. I taught theater I was a scenic and lighting designer. I worked with students. Years after I would, the students would graduate, they would tell me things like, you remember that day when I did this and I did that and then you said this and it changed my life? I had no clue. Because I was being myself. I was just being RPAT, doing RPAT things and that student just happened to be there. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> um, we get wiser. <laughs> but you get wiser in this process. So I want to hear from someone else what their journey was like. Because I think the answer is going to be, for me, is that your truth changes with you as you get more information. See, the next phase of my life was being a public speaker. Now, I've got to tell you, I'm just like everybody else. What's the, what's the number one fear in America? Public, public speaking. speaking. Yeah. I was petrified. I was a quiet, shy guy. I was afraid to talk to people. So what I do, I took Toastmasters. Well, what happens when you take Toastmasters? You get a little more confidence. You get a little, you get a little bigger, and you get a little, ooh, yeah, and I could do this, and I could do that. And, whew, man, that was a lifesaver. Me, a minister? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Just not going to happen. I had no clue that that was happening. Not a clue. I didn't know what I was going to. But what happened? As I became more aware, I started saying, yes. Not no, yes. As we say yes, the universe rushes in. As soon as we say yes again, it just rushes in and rushes in. Because when you're saying yes, you're getting rid of the no. See how that works? It's like, whew, it's gone. So then, now that I'm getting close to retirement, it's changing again. My creative expression, expression, is manifesting in my photography. That's something I would do 24-7, seven days a week. My creative expression. And I get to speak. And I get to motivate. And I get to teach. So I would say that in my lifetime, there was this that became this that became this with not a lot of planning on my part. Because that's who I was. That's why I'm destined to be here, I think. But that's my answer. So, who dares to tell me their story, their opinion, their experience with angels and things, chakras, centers, energy, life force, love, Rumi, 
great consciousness, universe, Mother Earth, Father Sky, everything that's bigger than ourselves. Anybody? Oh. All I wanted to be growing up was a mom. <laughs> that was my life's ambition. I just wanted to be a mom. And I didn't care about who impregnated me. I just wanted to be a mom. Wow. No, I mean, that's the truth. I was like a black widow spider. I just, you know. Um, <laughs> well, I'm so sorry. I just couldn't help that. I, no, I think that's phenomenal. It gives us a whole new perspective on it. The you. truth. <laughs> the truth is. But anyway, so, and I knew, and I loved to talk. I, of course, everybody knows I love to talk. And so when I was in Mary Kay, when my kids were babies, because I didn't want to leave them, then I started talking in front of 12 people. And then pretty soon it was 24, and then pretty soon it was 2,000 in Dallas. And you just grow. You know, you're talking about Toastmasters. That's the way I just grew. And then because of this lady, um, I, through Mary Kay, read the book and loved the book. The Power of Your Subconscious Mind by Dr. Joseph Murphy. And I raised the kids on that whole philosophy. And this lady, one day at a, another meeting, said something about what you think about, you bring about. And I went, wait a minute, what? That's Joseph Murphy's line. And I said, where is that place? <laughs> and she told me, here. And so now, and the minute I walked in and I saw Dr. Heather, and I saw the practitioners, and I went, in a couple of three weeks, I didn't do the first day, but I thought, I want to be a practitioner. That's what I want to be in my older years. That's what I want to be. I want to help people. And not in Mary Kay, where you're kind of scamming people. I want to help people. <laughs> As we're going live. <laughs> anyway, but my dreams are coming true, and I... I'm very, very, very thankful for this journey that I've been so on. So my question is, to you or anyone else, is has it changed? Have you ever, has anyone ever found that in the middle of your lifetime, it just went in a totally different direction? Or how many are still looking for the life purpose? Ah, we have one in the back. Okay. So... Uh, <laughs> has it changed for you? Has your life purpose changed? Well, you said, are you looking for your purpose? She's still looking for his life, her life purpose. So, in your journey to search for your life purpose, what have been your roadblocks? Myself. And how so? Negative self talk. Is that what used a microphone? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, louder. <laughs> Louder. Okay. Uh, negative self-talk, lack of self-confidence. Um, I'm probably my worst critic, and I've been that way since I was a very little girl. And I've allowed it to keep my dreams at bay and let fear control my life. And so I'm at a crucial point. I'm getting ready to turn 50, and I'm like, what do I want to be when I grow up? So that's one of the reasons I'm here tonight. I've got to tell you a little secret, but you're not the only one that has ever thought that their negative thinking has held them back from their moving forwards, because that's exactly what it is. That's what Ernest Holmes has been saying from day one. Get rid of your stinking thinking, because it's what holds you back from being in this world. So, if the universe abhors a vacuum, Right? There's no room for anything to come in. All those negative thoughts take up space. All those negative thoughts take up energy. And until you get rid of them one by one, as soon as you do that, whoosh, another one comes in. Whoosh, another one comes in. Before you know it, the whole thing is going to be about the positive you, not the fearful you. But once you get it, 
once you see it, once you recognize it and believe it, that's the hard part. Do I deserve? Oh, do I deserve to be happy? Do I deserve to be rich? Do I deserve to be successful? Do I deserve to be free? The answer is yes. Unequivocally, the answer is yes. So thank you for being so brave to say that. That's fantastic. Anybody else? Can you talk a little more about what or how you define life purpose? You talked about why am I here? You're talking about objective accomplishments in the tangible world. Well, what do you mean life purpose? All right. <laughs> okay. Um, I think in human form, we don't have to, but if we don't give life meaning, who will give life meaning to us or for us? You don't have to give anything meaning. Nothing has to mean anything. The tree falls in front of your house and you weren't under it, that doesn't mean anything, right? But if you give it meaning, it does have some purpose, okay? So I am choosing to believe that there is something greater in the universe, greater than myself, that I'm somehow connected to that purpose. Somehow I have free will, I can tap into it, and it's going to set me off on a path. Deepak Chopra gave the best explanation uh, for something. He says, imagine being on a, a train, and you're on a railroad track, okay? And the train is you. It's your train. You get to see how clean it is, how bright it is, how dirty it is. You get to see if it's filled with furniture, no furniture, shiny, new. You get to choose if it goes forwards or backwards or stands still. You get to make all those choices. So you can go slowly forwards. You can turn right on this track. You can turn left on this track. You can go straight on this track. You can go backwards. But all paths lead to one place, and that's God. You're the chooser. You're trained. You get control. But you're all going to the same place. Okay? Now, that's how I give life meaning as opposed to being a lump of clay when I'm dead and that's it. And maybe someone who's an atheist thinks differently. Maybe you think that's it, end of the world. That's all we're good for. Does that help? Yeah. Well, how does life purpose, what, what is your life purpose? <laughs> I would say that um, the creative energy flowing through me has not changed in my whole life, and now I understand the truth of that. And interestingly, a lot of my hobbies and interests and expressions of that creative interest haven't changed either all my life, which is fun and fortunate to be able to grow and do, and especially when you get old enough to buy the good supplies. <laughs> when you're a grown up, you get to buy all the toys you wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that. Um, so as far as what I'm, what interests me the most and, and fascinates me and puzzles me and intrigues me, there hasn't been a lot of change. There's been additions. Um, I didn't grow up wanting to have a child, but that was a wonderful bonus that then blossomed into things I never dreamed of ever even wanting because I didn't know that kind of love existed with a child. So for you, your core has stayed the same and little things up and down, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so, and which is interesting because coming full circle now, my child and grandchild and and the whole family have moved, 
And so a lot of the things I used to do with them, there's time and a gap now. And my first instinct is to go back to what did I love as a little girl? Mm -hmm. What did I love BC before a child? Yeah, that's right, BC. That I still love doing, and there's so much. The different art forms and, and things that I still enjoy. So I see that creative expression as a big part of my life purpose, as well as this bonus of having raised an amazing woman who happened to choose me to be her mom, <laughs> and she's now raising an amazing child. That's right. You know, we get caught up in this thinking that life purpose has to be some bold, noble endeavor to save the world from SARS or coronavirus. No. It could be simple. It could be humble. It could be powerful. It could be to help little children. That's right. Oh, and I'll just say P.S. There was, being a child of the 60s and 70s, there was that save the world piece of being. And so I, my entire career was spent in um, appropriate landscape design and water conservation. There you go. So I have done my part to save the earth. <laughs> Anyone else? Come on, there's got to be somebody else. See, it's never too late. It's never too late to have it your way. It's never too late to have it your way. If not now, when? Yeah. Who's going to give you permission to move forward? Who's going to give you permission to change your life? Nobody but you. If not, then when? If not now, when? Doesn't matter where you are on this journey. Just say yes, just say yes, just say yes, just say yes. But get rid of the no, get rid of the no, get rid of the no, get rid of the no. And you feel a lot better. Well, I guess if I had to put it in words... Uh, yes, you do. <laughs> I'm asking you to do that. That's difficult for a no, but, but I will attempt it. Um, I think the best words um, would be, uh, I am that I am. And it's just that simple. You know, I grew up wanting to be a minister. And then I worked at the church office for a couple of weeks, and then no way in hell. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, I want to be involved in it. You know, and, and I joined the Army. I went to war. It changed my life. And so my path has been uh, realizing what I wanted to do and saying no, and then um, uh, getting to live through all the changes that uh, I've taken by making choices and realizes, realizing that my choices uh, uh, have consequences uh, that are good and, and bad, and, and, but that's life. And as I grew, uh, not just my waistline, but as I grew as a human being uh, and I discovered trying to be conscious and as we all know how difficult that is <laughs> and yeah. uh, so when I was learning about some of these things that you were talking about talking to the spirits and, and uh, seeing uh, seeing, feeling knowing certain things and uh, learning about uh, Oh, what do you call it? The, when you commu nonverbal communication with other people, you know. And then I had this friend that was really receptive, uh, and so I started having him put on the record, you know, play the Jefferson airplane, you know. <laughs> and he'd get up and put the Jefferson airplane on, you know. And then by accident, uh, someone gave me. Uh, well, not by accident, but uh, I received a metaphysical meditation book by Yogananda, and uh, which really helped me to become 
uh, more aware, more conscious, and knowing that developing certain skills, while they'd be fun and useful and handy, uh, that they would sidetrack me from becoming, uh, having that union with God that I was looking for when I was 16, when I thought I wanted to be a minister. And uh, so, and then through that, I realized, oh, gee, I, I can't put God in a box or a religion. How can I shrink him down that far? Uh, I, I couldn't do it. And so I just ended up having to open myself up to, uh, to whatever. I think that's kind of when I became a Taoist and, and just accepted what came uh, and uh, became more of an observer, you know. Uh, but yet, learning to take action, uh, uh, so I don't know, that's kind of my story. Cool, cool. Thank you. you know, it's like, how does Lao Tzu or the Buddha or Jesus or Muhammad, how are their teachings different or, or not the same or, or helpful or not helpful? You know, they're all wonderful, powerful beings and it's our job to pick what is right for us. It's our job to pick our truth, you know? And so far what I'm hearing is that, that the core of you, the core of all of you, is still intact. And it just changes as you get older. The core of you is still the core of you. The moment you say yes, doubt goes away. Yes. Yes. Anybody else? Time for one more? Come on. Come on. Be, be brave. Joyce. In uh, this lifetime, my uh, purpose was well known to me from a very young age. And that purpose has been crystal clear and has remained exactly the same. And the purpose is to serve. In my life, it's to serve. And, and to serve for God and to know God and be one with God through service. And I... Um, was afforded multi a multitude of experiences where I was able to, to manifest that in my lifetime. And I had so many different uh, life-changing and deep experiences with so many human beings um, in this life of service. So it has always stayed the same and true for me. But my life, I did so many different things in so many different parts of the world and met all different kinds of people. Um, you know, all these people and experiences reflecting God. But my purpose has always remained um, constant. It's been um, crystal clear the whole time. That's been my experience. Cool. Very cool. You know, we're powerful people. We really are. We just have to trust. Trust that there's something, in my opinion, greater than ourselves. Trust that we can trust that higher power. Trust and verify that it's repeatable. Trust that Ernest Holmes had something good to say. What you think about, you bring about. What you believe to be true shows up and manifests in your life. So if your beliefs need a little house cleaning, take care of that. If not now, when? Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> Wonderful, Reverend Marpan. Very nice. Thank you. It reminds me of that, that song that we sing sometimes, love. You know, what's our purpose? Love serve and remember. So God is love. First name, God is love. Other before I, after I am that I am, is love. We're here, life purpose is to love, to be 
God and expression and to love and to serve. And then the third one, remember, remember opening your mind, opening your consciousness. Let's give him another hand. That was really great. Thank you so much. Wonderful talk.